The latest Star Trek Discovery novel, The Enterprise War by John Jackson Miller, recently hit shelves and is full of fun little facts and continuity references to more Star Trek media than you might expect. Hello everyone, my name is Captain Jack and welcome to Trek Central. Today we're going to be taking a look at all the references in this exciting new novel. As you should expect, there will be spoilers ahead, so if you've not read this book and do not want to be spoiled, turn off now. If you want to know this book may be for you, you can watch our spoiler free book review of this fantastic novel, there's a link in the description. Now, let's hit it. Hit it. The prologue of the novel starts in 2236 with a younger Christopher Pike as he's involved in an ill-fated expedition to the Burr Smith Tunnel, an actual tunnel complex in El Paso Mountains in the Mojave Desert, where we already know Pike comes from. We find out that the United States military put numerous military bases in the Mojave for the Third World War, an event which is talked about many times in other Trek media. A cave-in occurs and Pike loses one of his friends, something he regrets deeply, similarly to how he acts when he loses people in the unaired the original series pilot, The Cage, on a mission to Rigel 7. The mission to Rigel 7 and The Cage is also mentioned numerous times within the book. Pike also develops claustrophobia from his cave-in and used to be asthmatic, with his dreams for the future including piloting shuttles, running his own ranch, or enlisting in Starfleet. At the beginning of the novel, Pike gets a communique from Starfleet talking about the outbreak of the Klingon Federation War in 2256. The casualties list include the USS Clark, Edison, Europa, Shenzhou, Shran, Taplan Half, and Jaeger. All these ships and the battle were seen in the first episode of Star Trek Discovery in the Battle of the Binary Stars. Throughout the book, we are introduced to some new bridge officers on the USS Enterprise, including Lieutenant Raiden, a Kataran, whose species we've seen in Voyager, notably Natomi Wildman, who is half Kataran human hybrid. Jose Tyler, a navigator seen in the cage, is mentioned as having left the Enterprise recently. Science Officer Connolly is also somewhat a main character in this book, specialising in gravimetrics. This science officer was seen in the first episode of season 2 of Discovery, in which he dies soon after crashing into the breeze. Yeah. Relax and let me do the Pergamum Nebula, in which the Enterprise's mission is located, is close to the Ionite Nebula, a region of space in the Alpha Quadrant home to the Lurians, a dim witcher species to which our favourite character of Morn from Deep Space Nine is one. They're said to keep most of their thoughts of their own, probably explaining why we never heard Morn talk throughout the entirety of Deep Space Nine. Number one, Pike's first officer, is given the name of Una. She is said to have grown up on Illyria Colony, a species seen in Enterprise who are native to the Delphic Expanse. The mission to Syrah 3, in which the Enterprise worked with a Shenzhou, is also brought up, a mission seen in the Discovery tie novel, Desperate Hours. We've got a spoiler-free book review for that heading here very soon, so make sure to subscribe to keep up to date with that. Commander Narn is seen in a role as Enterprise's Chief Security Officer, a Barzan who became a member of the Discovery's bridge crew in Season 2. The current Chief Engineer of the USS Enterprise is an Armenian professor called Dr. Avidas Galadian. His research has led to most of the improvements on the Enterprise, and he's received two Cochrane Medals of Excellence, named after the inventor of Earth's first warp drive, Zephyrin Cochrane. He also has diplomas and accommodations from the Zephyrin Cochrane Institute for Advanced Theoretical Physics, and also the Alpha Centauri Academy of Science and Technology. Not to mention he has also shook hands with three Federation presidents. Yeah, fun fact. The chief engineer position of the Enterprise is also said to be a revolving door of people, as it keeps changing. Many of the people listed have taken up the job, including... Kersley, who activated the ship's warp drive for a christening ceremony, was named in the novelization of a final of the animated series episode, The Counter Clock Incident. Maverick, moves with Burning Grace, seen in the early Voyages comics. Michael Bernstein, featured in some of the original series novels. Transporter Chief Nils Pictan, seen in the cage. And finally, Caitlin Berry, also from the original series novels, who left to advise Starfleet on the Constitution class. When she left, she took a young Ensign Montgomery Scott, the man who would one day be the most famous of the Enterprise chief engineers. As the Enterprise leaves the Pergamma Nebula to talk with Starfleet about the war, Pike talks to Rear Admiral Terrell, a Vulcan Admiral seen in Season 1 of Discovery. While they're talking, the holographic communication system is mentioned, and that the Enterprise had always rejected it. We find out that the Enterprise was refitted after its mission to Talos IV two years prior, replacing its armament of lasers with phasers. Pike is worried that Starfleet is moving away from its mission of exploration by outfitting science ships with state-of-the-art weaponry. The last refit also included the shiny new Enterprise uniform seen in Discovery. This gives us a date of how long this type of Starfleet uniform has been in use for. Yeoman Mia Colt is also featured in the book. The young Yeoman also was in the Enterprise crew in the cage. She is said to have changed a lot since her mission to Talos IV, yet is still very devoted to Captain Pike. 
Spock remarks on Michael Burnham's decision to mutiny, not being able to visualise any situation that would lead him to commandeer the Enterprise. This foreshadows the original series episode, The Miragini, in which Spock takes control of the Enterprise to get Pike to the Talosians on Talos IV. This also shows how far Spock comes from his Pike days to where we see him in the original series with Captain James T. Kirk. The peace talks on Cancry 4 is mentioned as having failed, alongside Vice Admiral Cormel's capture, which we see in the Discovery episode Le Fief. Pike remarks on how the ship should have its own nature park, and not just the small botanical garden the Enterprise has. This probably hints at the advanced holodeck scene on the Enterprise D, also possibly mentioning the small arboretum, which we see in a few episodes of the original series. Pike mentions his poor score in astrophysics to Connolly, a great scene in Discovery Season 2 premiere episode, Brother. I wonder why he failed that exam. Now Connolly is said to be a huge fan of baseball. Seems like in the future, Starfleet officers really like baseball, with another big baseball fan being Benjamin Sisko in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Dr. Philip Boyce makes an appearance in the book, being the Enterprise's chief medical officer. He was seen in the cage, and still keeps his bag filled with cocktails in case he needs to get a patient to talk. He remarks that Starship should have a counsellor, something seen in the next generation with counsellor Deanna Troy. When landing on a planet for a survey, Pike remarks that he would like to see some horses. Pike loved horses as a child, and had two called Tango and Mary Lou. Magnusite is mentioned as something that can block scanners. This is also mentioned in a couple of other Trek episodes, blocking scanners and also transporter functions. The Enterprise is said to be able to do a saucer separation, but has never actually considered doing it, as it would be a last resort. This was seen as a feature of the Constitution-class starship in the feature film Star Trek Beyond, set in the Kelvinverse. Saucer separation has actually been an idea for the Constitution class since the original series, being mentioned in behind the scenes for a long time and also many technical manuals. Antarans are seen, a species known to be enemies of the Denoblians, to which Dr. Flocks and Enterprise is one. It's said that the two species are still not on the best of terms even in the TOS era. The antagonists of this book, The Boundless, are said to use isolinear chips, something that Starfleet doesn't use for another half a century in its starships, most notably still using duotronic systems. To calm down, Science Officer Conley recites baseball information. This reminds Spock that he also does the same, but with the precepts of logic from when his thoughts get chaotic. Spock does this during Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery, from when he communicates with a Red Angel and his mind becomes a temporal mess. The Orion Syndicate is mentioned as being much more proficient in its acts of piracy than Allurians a much bigger threat to the Federation due to their proximity to the member worlds of the Federation. Orions were seen in Enterprise, the original series, and Deep Space Nine. Spock is said to be familiar with conflict, recounting the logic extremists of Vulcan who nearly killed Michael Burnham in their bombing of a Vulcan learning center. News comes in from the Federation Klingon War, with Cornwall being recovered, the USS Discovery going missing in action, and the massacre at Kel 44 has happened. All events are seen or mentioned in Starship Discovery. Galadian, the engineer, mentions a Tuscat, an American machete, a concept to help maneuver through the dense regions of the Pergam Nebula. The engineer also says that anything they learn here may also help future enterprises traverse many varieties of space. The SS Columbia, a ship which carried Vena and crashed on Talos IV in the cage, is mentioned as happening in 2236. Optical Data Network Cabling, or ODN Cabling, is mentioned as a system of fiber optic cables employed on a starship to carry information. These cables are seen in many iterations of Star Trek, including The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. Spock can use Sus Manha, a Vulcan martial art that both T'Pol and Michael Burnham are proficient at. While floating in space, Spock has a nightmare about the Red Angel he saw as a child, something seen in the second season of Discovery, when the Red Angel tells the young Spock where his sister Michael Burnham is in. The USS Saratoga is mentioned as having been lost, as well as Starbase 22. This is mentioned in the briefing in the Discovery episode The War Without the War Within, as being tailed by a cloaked Klingon raider who subsequently blew up the Saratoga as it was docking at Starbase 22, resulting in the destruction of the ship and the Starbase. Transparent aluminum is mentioned, a material Scotty let Plexicorp create back in 1986, seen in the film The Voyage Home. Starfleet shipwrights aren't going to design a full battle bridge unless they think we'd be likely to use it, says number one. A battle bridge is later seen in the next generation on the Enterprise D, when saucer separation is a much more used technique. As Spock gets stuck on a snowy planet, he recalls that snow is theoretical to Vulcans and fascinated him as a young child, having only seen it on a close-up on Delta Vega. Delta Vega is Vulcan's sister planet. Spock calls his new planet Scone's World, after his forefather Scone, father to Sarek. As Spock says, there's already two Delta Vegas, as you know. 
This refers to the fact that Delta Vega is not only a planet at the edge of a galaxy, but in the 2009 film, they made Delta Vega a planet close to Vulcan as a callback to the original. Dot 6s are mentioned as being repair drones that can be deployed to the hull of the Enterprise for light house cleaning. They're outfitted to the Enterprise for this very mission, to aid in traversing dense nebula regions and repairing the hull from any damage to save EVA repair. During the events of the book, they run out of Dot 6s to deploy. The upgraded version of these drones, the Dot 7s, can be seen in the final of Discovery Season 2, where once again, they're used to repair the damaged parts of the Starship's hull. Site-to-site -site transporting is referred to as being relatively new technique in Starfleet, that is extremely resource intensive and therefore rarely used. Site-to-site -site transporting is only used in rare occasions even during the 24th century. An Anolian prison ship is mentioned as being attacked by the Baroness for recruitment. The Anolians are a species seen in Enterprise and known for their harsh judicial system. Kodavu is the homeworld of six sentient species that evolved on the same planet. Five of these species left Kadavu to form the Boundless, with the sixth being their enemy, the Rengru. This is similar to the Zindi species where six sentient species also evolved on the same planet. Herschel is one of the shuttles of the Enterprise, possibly named after William Herschel, a German-born British astronomer who had a statue in front of a Griffin Observatory in the episode of Voyager, Future's End. Jim Lovell, the commander of the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission, is mentioned. Another story told by the Enterprise crew of bad situations ships and starships have occurred. On the verge of death on the ice planet, Spock wonders about his culture and the fact it will die alongside his physical body. We've seen Spock transfer his culture before, most notably in the Wrath of Khan and the search for Spock, with the Vulcan catcher being seen in other various Trek media. Before passing out, Spock sees a red angel on the planet, a scene which is also seen in Star Trek Discovery Season 2. Spock mind melds with the Red Angel and begins his descent into Journey throughout Discovery. He sees seven fantastic powerful signals blazing like rubies in deep space. He then sees Earth, Kronos, Vulcan, Andorra and other worlds getting destroyed. Pike receives one of his final transmissions from Starfleet concerning the Klingon War, with a Klingon invasion of Earth imminent as seen in the final of Star Trek Discovery Season 1. Enterprise is ordered to not return and tell the story of Earth if the war goes badly. As Spock is brought back to the saucer section of the Enterprise, he keeps repeating the same words, Earth, Kronos, Vulcan, Andoria, with him also asking what time it is, as his mind is in chaos over the vision he witnessed from melding with a red angel. The process of rejoining the saucer and the whole sections of the Constitution starship after separation is said to be a difficult process, as saucer separation is a last resort system. This would later be changed in the Galaxy class starships where saucer detach could operate more easily. Phase transition coils, a component in transporters are mentioned, also having been mentioned in both the Next Generation and Voyager. After ending the war between the Boundless and the Rengru, Cormagan, the Boundless leader, offers to join the war against the Cleons. Pike refuses by saying, It's like what I told my Admiral. It matters how we fight, and with what. Echoing Pike's views seen in the second season of Discovery. Because of Lieutenant Connolly's experiences throughout the year, he requests a more active role from Pike, leading to more away teams. Pike is concerned about this, as Connolly was already headstrong before his experiences, which have only seemed to spur him more. This obviously leads to his away mission to the USS Horafu, in which he gets killed by the debris. As the Enterprise begins to make its way home, the transfers of officers begin. Raiden returns home and is replaced by Jose Tyler, the original helmsman of the Enterprise seen in the cage. Spock is still dealing with his encounter with the Red Angel, trying to bring clarity to what he witnessed. He requests that he be taken to a facility where he could be helped. Before Pike leaves, Spock says that he himself will take Pike to also be helped, probably mentioning into the future episodes in which Spock takes Pike to Talos IV to live out his days with Vina after being left in a wheelchair. Spock gets taken to the facility on Starbase 5 aboard the shuttle Copernicus. We see Spock in Starbase 5 in Discovery. With Spock's absence, Conley is made the acting chief science officer of the Enterprise. The holographic communication system is mentioned again, as still being broken even after an attempt to fix it. They can't get any luck with this. Everyone on Enterprise is awarded the Extended Tour Ribbon, a Starfleet decoration issued to officers who have fulfilled or exceeded an obligated tour of duty. An award not only seen on Pike's personal file on Discovery, but also seen in the Next Generation episode, Eye of the Beholder. In the very final chapter, Pike gets a call from Nicola, saying that he received seven signals. Neither Pike or Una know what this means, but know that there's no rest for the weary. Obviously, these are the seven red bursts that the Enterprise sees before the events of meeting the USS Discovery in the final of Discovery Season 1. And that is everything we're able to find in the novel The Enterprise War by John Jackson Miller. If we miss anything, please let us know in the comments section below. If you want to hear our spoiler-free review of the book, that'll also be linked down below in the description. 
Did you read The Enterprise War? If so, let us know what you thought of the novel in the comments section below. To keep up to date with all the latest Star Trek news, lore and more, then make sure to subscribe to Trek Central here on YouTube to never miss a video. For now, I've been Captain Jack, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.